we're in a summer sermon series in the book of Galatians, and um, a couple weeks back, you know, um, I, I preached a different sermon because I felt the Holy Spirit saying, hey, I don't want you to preach that this week, so preach this. And I kind of find it humorous because Jerry was actually supposed to have actually talked two weeks ago on Operation Christmas Child, and he said, Scott, that's not going to work for me this week, that time, so let's, let's bump it back. And so that fell on this day. And he's over here talking about, you know, Christmas boxes. And interestingly enough, this passage of Scripture that we're talking about, this miraculous moment, a lot of times is preached at Christmas. Because this passage of Scripture right here in the middle, when we get to verses uh, five, uh, 4 and 5, it is all about the birth of Jesus. Even though it doesn't, have the, it doesn't tell the story of the nativity and it doesn't all that stuff, this passage is used a lot in Christmases. Uh, like you can actually go on, online and you can type in you know, Galatians 4, 1 through 7, and you'll see a lot of Christmas sto- sermons about this particular passage. So I find it kind of interesting that we're talking about Christmas boxes, Christmas boxes, and we're talking about a Christmas passage. I find that kind of interesting. The Father's, Father's good all the time, and all the time the Father's good. So Galatians chapter 4, let's look at verses 1 through 7, and then we'll start to unpack this miraculous moment, which obviously, by the way, is obviously the miraculous moment is, is the birth of Jesus and what he then did. So, so now I say, as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, although he is owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by the father. So also we, while we were children, were held in bondage under the elemental things of the world. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of, uh, of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Praise the Lord. Let's go to the Father for a moment in prayer. Father, I do pray that you will be with us over these next few moments as we look at this particular passage and help our hearts to be receptive to the truth therein, and and to the salvation and the experience of salvation that is is described and portrayed in this particular passage. Father, I pray that you would grow us in our relationship with you, that you would, um, because of our our sonship, if you will, our our being an inheritance to you, being co-heirs with Christ as a result of our salvation, Father, I pray that we would understand what that fullness of life means, that we'd understand what that victory in you means, and that we begin to live lives that demonstrate and declare our allegiance to you and point to your power and to your victory and to your great name. Father, I thank you even for this time of service. Father, I even thank you for, for faces that, that I've seen already this morning that, that I haven't seen in a very long time because of COVID, and I'm grateful for their return. Father, I pray that you continue to bless all who are here today and those that are watching online, and Father, that you would be glorified as a result of this time together. We love you, Lord Jesus. We ask for your favor over these next few moments as we look at your scriptures. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. There's three quick points this morning to this miraculous moment. Three quick points. So the first one is this. It is what we were what we were, and the answer is slaves. That is what we once were. We were slaves. Now, let's look at the passage and let's unpack it for a few moments. It's verses 1 through 3. So again, coming back to Paul to see what he actually said in in more further detail, he says, now I say, as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, though he is owner of everything. But he, is not, but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by the Father. So also we, while we were children, were held in bondage under the elemental things of the world. Now, and he's talking, obviously, he's using some figurative type language, and he's also using some language to help us to understand the rights 
that, that we as individuals might have or not have. And he's trying to help us see this picture. For, for an example, um, he, he uses this concept of this child, and he basically says this child is a, is a slave because they're not, they haven't come to the age of personal uh, authority and autonomy in their own life. So for an example, um, I'm looking, at, you know, looking around here, seeing some parents and stuff in the back there and things. Um, when, who, who gets, <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me clarify that because I realize we live in a different world. Who ought to tell the child when the child ought to go to bed? The, the parent ought to tell the child when the child goes to bed, okay? And, and who tells the child when he ought or she ought to wake up in the morning? I mean, they don't necessarily have, if they, maybe the child's responsible enough, you set the alarm for them, but, but, but who determines what time children are supposed to rise, especially during school season? The, the parents are ultimately responsible, okay? You know, like, and again, I realize, I realize we're living in a different world, but like, but like, like if you come to the Tharp household, and, and, I, and I say, or Christy says, hey, we're having, we're having chicken for dinner. Guess what the kid is having for dinner? Ch- chicken. Chicken. There's, there's, there's no, but that's not what I want. I'm sorry. You're a slave. You don't have a choice. <laughs> okay? You're going you're to eat what I put in front of you. Okay? You don't have the freedoms to choose what you want to eat. All right? Be a part of the Tharp household, you also have to do chores. You know? It does, I see. You got chores? You got chores? That's a good thing. I know you don't think it's a good thing. It's a good thing. You need to have chores. And if you don't do the chores, there should be consequences to your lack of action toward the chores. Got it? <laughs> but, but they have chores. So, so, like my kids regularly say, you just have us for, to be slaves in here. No, just go do the dishes. <laughs> it's nothing to do with your slavery. You're just part of this family, and it's part of us teaching you how to be responsible human beings. So get in there and do the dishes. This is kind of the imagery that's going on. The child doesn't have the rights to say, well, I don't want to do that. Well, see, here's the reality. He's using a spiritual principle here, okay? And, 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 and in this phraseology, he even when you got down to verse 3, did you, you all might have some different language in your scriptures there. But like mine says that, that while we were, were children, in other words, while we were under the, the custodianship and the guardianship of the law, we, we didn't have any responsibilities. And what he says there in verse 3, he says, and while we were children, we were held in bondage. This is intentional language that he's using. We were held in bondage under, and here's where you might have some different phrases there. Mine says, the elemental things of the world. You, you might have words like uh, rudimentary teachings or elementary teachings or basic uh, uh, teachings or something like that. You might even have the word principle there. And that word principle, it might actually be the better of the words here in this context. So, so you could read it this way. You, you were held under bondage under the principles of the world. That might actually be the better of all the possible translations there for that particular Greek word, is the principles of this world. See, here's, here's what I'm wanting you to understand, and why I'm going I'm to spend some time here thinking about this for a moment. The principles of this world are what lost individuals are slaves to. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Again, I just went through all this thing just talking about like parents and kids, and the kids don't have rights in this regard, except for the rights that the parent gives to them. Well, when you're talking about slaveship, when you're talking about this world system, it's even far worse than what it is like with parent and kids. Okay? So when I say that we are, we are, we are in bondage, bondage is obviously language of, of being shackled up. It's a, it's a, it's a prison-type language. I, I don't have choice. I'm bound. I have to do what the, the guard or the master dictates for me to do. It's how I have to respond. That's this language, okay? And so I'm in bondage to the principles of this world. So if one does not have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, one has to respond to the principles of this world. Now, 
We can, there, there are, you just need to understand, there are some, because of just societal norms, somebody might write, be, be raised up and they might be moral people, but what is it they're still a slave to? They're still a slave to their passions and bondage of their sinful nature. In other words, they might, they might be able to curb it off for a season, but they are going to eventually fall prey to the temptation of sin. It's because it is who we are before we come to know Christ. So we have literally no ability within us to hold it off for any length of time. And so when you say that they are in bondage to the principles of this world, we shouldn't be surprised when the world acts and lives and responds like the world. The world is what the world is. And we who are in Christ ought not to go, well, I just can't believe they did that. You ought to be saying when they actually do something good, you ought to be going, I can't believe they did that correctly. That would be the better response. When a lost person enters into sin, you should expect that. That's what lost people do. And so you should be going, didn't surprise me. They didn't have a relationship with Jesus. They were not eternally changed. They were not born again. So what else did you expect? I mean, just, it was, it was, I think it was two weeks ago. Christian and I went on a date. We were talking, hey, what do you want to, what do, we want to do? And she goes, well, what's, what's in the movie theater? I said, I don't know. I haven't been to a movie in a long, long time. I said, I don't, I haven't got a clue. So we, we pulled up. There's like, there was, because of the whole COVID stuff, movies aren't doing what they normally do. They're not releasing, you know, like eight, ten movies at a time. So there's, there were like four movies in the theater. And then they showed a couple reruns from like in the 80s. And those weren't any good either, by the way. But, but three of them were about mass murderers who were demon-possessed. Um, one was actually about demon possession. The other one was an R-rated movie that I can't remember even now what it was about, but it was Blood and Guts too. And then the only one, that, the PG-13 one, was Cruella, the origin story of why she's mentally deranged. Okay? Those were the choices? Mass murderers, demon possession, or Cruella. So we went to a steakhouse and had dinner. Yeah, it was, it was a much better choice. <laughs> it's a much better choice. But do you understand, should we be surprised when this is what Hollywood puts out? No, we shouldn't be surprised by that. We shouldn't be surprised by that. W uh, uh, movies, entertainment, media, whatever, it is all pushing agendas, pushing agendas, pushing agendas. All right? It's all pushing us towards the sinfulness of this world, the acceptance of this. And it doesn't make a difference what subject we're talking about. And, what, and where the problem comes in is the church has said, well, yeah, we realize that's the way the world is, and so we'll just let the world be the world, and we'll just continue to be our little bubble. Well, that's not what this has called us to do, and we're going to talk about what we are called to do here in just a moment. Okay, so you understand? We are slaves before we know Christ. But, but, but God said, this might have been who you were. What, what were you? You were a slave, but you need to know what I did. What did I do? And that's the second part. The second part is what God did. What God did. He saved us. He saved us. We don't have to remain in bondage, but not because we had the ability to break our shackles. You didn't have the ability to break your shackles. If you could have, you would have. But God said, because you can't break your shackles, I will break your shackles. And that is what this next section is about. Look at, look at four and five. But when the fullness of the time came, this is the Christmas story right here, the fullness of time at the perfect moment in human history during the Pax Romana, during this time period where everything was converging to make the perfect time in human history for the Son of God to be revealed at the perfect time, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman. So he is fully God. He is fully man. Fully the God-man. Born under the law. 
Just like you and I were born under the law, we are born under the sinful nature of the law, and the law is revealing to us, you're a sinner. You are one who doesn't do right. That's what the law was revealing. It is showing us that we cannot meet the standard. And he's saying, Christ was born under that law. Oh, but praise God. He was born under that law so that he might redeem those who were under the law. See, he didn't sin. Because he was fully God and fully man, he perfectly responded to the way that we ought to have been living. And he perfectly lived a sinless life and died on that cross, shedding his blood for your sins and for my sins, for your wrongs and my wrongs. He paid the ultimate price. It is the reason he came, was to give to us what we could not give ourselves. And so out of this, he redeems us who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. This is what it's all about, beloved. This is what it's all about. You could not do it. So because you couldn't, God says, I'll do it. I will save you. I will come in. I will rescue you. Now, look, obviously you all know, those that are here, those that are online may not know this, and some of you that are, are, are here with us for the first time, you may not know this, but me and Christian, we have three adopted kids. That's what we have. My adopted kids have every legal right to everything that we have. And that's even, even in that first part, even though, they were, even though they're slaves, right? <laughs> even though they're slaves, it said there, even that first part, it says that they, they had the legal right to it, did it not? It says... It said, but as long as they are heirs, the child, he does not differ from the slave, though he is the owner of everything. Okay? So if something were to happen to me and Christy, our will states that our kids get it. Now, granted, they get it incrementally because they're, they're still kids, right? So they get it in, in, in allotments along the way if we were to die right now. Okay? Now, when they become adults, though, when they get to a certain age and we die, what do they get? They, they get all that $5. That's right, Janice. They, <laughs> they get all that $5. <laughs> and they get to split it three ways, that $5. All of it. All of it they get, right? So, so do, you, do you see what I'm saying? But they, so it's theirs. As soon as we adopted them, everything I have became theirs. Everything. It is all theirs, even though they're slaves. Just go ask them. They'll tell you. Go ask them, Okay? So this is, this, is, this is what we're saying. Jesus Christ says, you are adopted into the family. You're adopted into the family. And because you're adopted into the family, the yoke of bondage is broken. And now because he's perfect, he lives within us. And we are now not sinners. We are saints. We are literally new creations. We are, we are, what was old is gone. He says, I've taken that old heart, I've removed that old heart of stone, and I've put in a heart of flesh that is pliable and moldable, and, and I am the potter, and you are the clay, and I'm making you, and I'm shaping you. This is all the Old Testament language of what God did for us. And so we rest in that, and we live in that. We have freedom in that, and we have hope in that. And it changes everything because it leads into this last point. So we, what we were, we were slaves, and what God did is he saved us. And what we become, what we become is sons. We become sons. Look at this last part, verse 6 and 7. Because you are sons god has sent forth the spirit of his son where does he send it into our hearts and then what is he then what because we're sons what do we have the privilege to do crying abba father therefore you are no longer a slave what you once were 
but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Now, what did I just not tell you about everything that my kids have? When Chris and I adopted them, what did they legally have as soon as we adopted them and we brought them in the States? Everything. You are sons of God. Do you understand? What do you have? Everything. I don't, okay. Are you getting it? This is God. And he has just now said, in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, when the, in the Old Testament, when the high priest, how did they enter into the Holy of Holies? Carefully. <laughs> Care, carefully. No, that's, but that's right. There was always once a year, and it was with fear and trembling. And there ought to be an aspect of awe when we're talking about the holiness of God. But at the exact same time, how do kids interact with their parents? Did daddy. And they just come on in, right? And they just, they like, daddy, 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 daddy. Wait, I'm talking, wait a minute. Right? You could be in the middle of a conversation, but they don't see that because they have the right as the child to come and get my attention anytime I, they want. Now, granted, now as a good parent, I need to say, wait one second, be patient. And my kids, I think they've learned that, I think, for the most part. Every now and then they, they, it struggles, but they but that's what they do. But I'm teaching them. But, but they have that right to come in. And if the, situation, if the situation actually warrants my attention, guess what happens to you if you're the one in the conversation with me? You lose. You understand? If the situation warrants my real attention, you lose. My kid's going to get my attention. You follow me? I love you. But they're going to always come first over y'all. Okay? And so because of that, I'm going to turn, and this is what God said. God's saying, you are my children, and because you're my children, now you have the right to enter into my throne room going, Abba, Father, Daddy, I just want to talk to you. I just want to spend time with you. I just want to be with you. I want, I want you you understand? And this is what this is all about. So you're no longer this slave who was once in bondage to sin where you couldn't resist it, but now you have the Holy Spirit who indwells you, and now you're this saint who is this heir of Christ, and because you're this heir of Christ, you have all the authority, you have all the power, you have all the resources, you have all the backing, you have all the ability, not in your strength, but in the strength of your adoption to say, no, I'm not going to walk that path. No, I'm not going to choose bondage to sin. No, I'm going to choose victory in Christ. Yes, to the glory of God. Yes, to his presence. Yes, to his power. Yes, to his presence. Yes, to my life in him. Yes, Lord Jesus, yes. And this is who you get to become. This is your inheritance and so often we walk around, even though we know this is the reality, we still walk around as if we've lost. Love, keep reading the book. You didn't lose. So quit acting like you lost. The gates of hell cannot prevail against us because we win. So the lostness in the world, let's go out and be light. What happens to darkness when you turn on a light? It dispels it, it can't do anything. It's a mirage, it's fictitious, it's not, it's no real power. And the one who is in you gives you greater power than the ones in the world. So why do we keep cowering? Why do we keep walking in fear? Why do we keep walking in doubt? Let us rise up and live boldly by faith to the inheritance that we have in Christ. To his glory, to his great name, to the praise of him. Let us worship and adore him. And this is what he is offering us. You don't have to be a slave. You can accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and say, Jesus, save me a sinner. He promises, I will come in, I'll give you a new heart, my Holy Spirit will come in you, and now you live victoriously. If you're watching online, this is the opportunity for you. If you're here in this room, this is the opportunity for you. It's free gift of salvation. 
And that's what this has been all about. And we're still, all this reason why we're doing this is because we're leading up to, what does all this life in Christ look like? Well, as we keep going through Galatians this summer, you're going to see what this life in Christ looks like and how it is supposed to live, be lived out victoriously. Let's go to the Father. Father, I do thank you for this time. I thank you for this opportunity that we have had to look at the life change we have in you. Well, I thank you that you didn't leave us in that state of slaves. I thank you that you saw us where we could not resist. We had no power against sin. And you said, I will come to you. You can't come to me, so I will come to you. I will make a way. I am the way maker to you. And Father, I thank you for all of us in this room and all of us that are watching online that have actually cried out and said, Lord Jesus, save me a sinner. Because it changes everything. It changes the way that we live in this world. It changes the boldness that we have. It changes the relationship we have with you. And Father, if there's anyone watching online, if there's anyone in this room that, that doesn't have a relationship with your son, Jesus Christ, I pray that today is the day that they will cry out and say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I, 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 I am, I've rebelled against you. I, I've chosen to walk in the manner of this world. I don't want to walk that way anymore. And Father, then, if you'd stir their heart to let them say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and save me. Father, we thank you so much that your spirit does do, that your Holy Spirit comes to then indwell us and to make us whole and new and clean and pure. And so now when you look upon us, Lord God, you, you don't see that old endemic sin nature. You now see the blood of your son, Jesus Christ, and you say, this is the righteousness of me in Christ Jesus. Thank you for that, Lord God. And now, Father, because of this gift, because of this, for those who will cry out and say, Lord Jesus, save me, the sinner. Father, they are now yours. They are your heirs. They are your sons and your daughters. They are born again. They are new creations. Father, I pray that you would help them to know who they are. Help them not to let Satan lie to them. Help them not to let Satan twist their thoughts and, and to attack them. But let them know that they have the power to take those thoughts captive and to lay them before the cross of Calvary and say, they are no more because of victory in Christ, in Christ alone. Oh, Father, you are powerful and you are good and you are glorious. Father, meet with us. In Jesus' name we pray.